Okay. Thank you, Tommaso. Uh, well, first of all, I have to uh, make a simple disclosure that I, and, and this is that I was not involved in any of the cases that uh, we are going to discuss. So, as Ali yesterday, I can provide uh, my independent and, and personal view. But uh, I was uh, involved in a, in a project that we did. Uh, for the OFT, and it's, it's the project that Tommaso just mentioned, uh, where we studied uh, these uh, best pricing policies, uh, and some part of, the, uh, part of the project was devoted to what we called a cross-platform parity uh, agreement. This is a kind of uh, a policy that is best known as MFN, or retail MFN, I have a personal view, my personal position is that this name is totally misleading, it shouldn't be used. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, the, the, the recent case just opened by the Commission against Amazon is about MFN and, you know, we are all discussing whether we can apply the kind of reasoning that was applied to the booking or Expedia or similar cases, but uh, as far as I understand, the, the, the Amazon case that the Commission is doing is one on a traditional MFN uh, close, and therefore probably the kind of uh, economic analysis that is required to understand the impact of this close is completely different. Uh, I, I, I won't go, come back on this. Okay, what I'm going to do is to uh, give a definition of APA, what we call APA, or parity clause. Uh, a very quick reference to the case law. I will actually just mention those cases because uh, they are uh, probably uh, well known to the, to the audience. But I will uh, uh, very briefly describe the theories of harm and the economic justifications that have been provided uh, during the investigation of those clauses in these cases. And then I will present a very simple framework to analyze the impact of this clause on a firm's incentives and therefore on the equilibrium of the market, and we'll try to uh, derive some conclusions. Okay, what is uh, an across-platform parity agreement? Okay, it's an agreement uh, between uh, um, a seller and a platform. So the seller and the platform are the two parties to the agreement. Uh, whereby the seller undertakes uh, not to charge uh, on other platforms, on other competing platforms, a price that is lower than the price that is charging on the, on the first platform, including new entrant platforms and possibly uh, the seller's own, uh, own platform. So one, uh, features that is, uh, one, one of the features that is important of this uh, clause is that the agreement is made by two parties, the seller and the platform, but is actually regulating the price that a third subject, that is the buyer, is going to pay to one of the parties to the agreement. Okay? So these are the, uh, the, uh, the parties to the agreement, and the subject that pays the price that, re that is regulated by the agreement is a third party. And, uh, and, uh, and according to the agreement, the price that the seller will charge on platform uh, one is somehow a function of the prices that uh, uh, the seller is going to charge on, on other platforms. Okay, there have been a number of cases. Some of them have been already uh, mentioned uh, the, the, the e-book cases both in the US and in the EU. I believe that these are very different cases uh, where you know, the main concern was about uh, some collusive behavior that was taking place in the uh, product market rather than uh, on the platform market. There, was, uh, uh, there were two investigations opened by the, um, the UK and the German uh, competition authorities uh, against Amazon uh, uh, on a proper um, parity close. And this case, those cases were closed because Amazon uh, changed uh, uh, its policy. It withdrew the, the parity close from its contract with sellers and therefore the two competition authorities decided to close the case. There have been a case on motor insurance by the UK competition authorities and a number 
of cases on online travel agents, some of which are still ongoing. I have to remember that the uh, three cases in Italy, France, and Sweden are not closed, actually. They've been closed against booking, but they're still investigating the close as far as Expedia is concerned. And, and there are a number of other uh, comp national competition authorities that are investigating this case. Okay, what are the theories of harm that have been um, applied or developed for, 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 for considering this, the anti-competitive effects of this, uh, of this clause? As I said, one of the theory of harm, uh, one of the theories of harm was that uh, this clause could uh, allow some degree of collusion in the product market, and this was uh, the theory of harm that was applied in the uh, e-book cases. Uh, another theory of harm refers to the possibility that this clause is used to soften competition in the platform market, or as a means to foreclose the platform market to new, uh, new rivals. As for the efficiency justification, uh, recently, uh, some economists have uh, filed a, um, a brief, an Amishi uh, Kuri brief uh, uh, in favor of Apple, uh, arguing that this clause was actually needed to allow Apple to enter the market. And so it's quite odd that you have you know, the same clause that can be explained in two opposite ways. You know, way, as a means to foreclose the market and as a means to enter the market. But we'll see that there is a way to, 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 to make sense of this uh, uh, seeming contradiction. And, uh, and the, the main argument that has been used in, uh, in those investigations refer to uh, the need to prevent some kind of free riding on the investments that uh, uh, platforms have to make to, uh, to be in the market. Okay, so the simple framework, I'm not going to uh, give you a formal model. I, I just want to uh, convey some kind of reasoning to, to approach and to analyze those uh, uh, agreements. Uh, so suppose there are two platforms. Um, uh, they have to set uh, the, some fees, some um, transaction-based fees. Uh, sellers observe these fees and they have to decide the price that they are going to charge on the various platforms. And then consumers observe the retail price, let's call it this way, and choose how much to buy and which platform to patronize. So uh, a useful way to describe the situation is that, you know, to go to a, a reduced form version of this, uh, let's call model, and, and consider that the number of transactions that will occur in the product market is, depends on uh, the uh, fees that the platforms are going to are, are charging, and the share of this transaction that each platform obtains is also a function of those fees. So that we can describe the um, platform one or two demand function in that way. You know, number of transaction times the market share of each, uh, of each, uh, of each platform. And it's useful to describe the demand function in this way because what we get is that uh, the uh, degree of market power this is not something that uh, can be applied only to platforms. This is true for any kind of firms. Anyway, the degree of market power depends on two things, two constraints. The first constraint I'll call it uh, platform market share or market share price elasticity. Uh, if suppose that I'm a butcher and I increase the price of my meat, consumers can react in two ways. First way is to stop buying the meat from me and go to another butcher. And so this is the first con constraint. Consumers move away from one platform to go to another platform. And the second constraint is that consumers move 
away from the market. They stop buying meat and they uh, buy other food. Okay, so the degree of market power depends on these two uh, kind of constraints, and the lower are those constraints, the higher is the market power. On this basis, we can see how the um, parity clause can affect the incentives of platform in when they set their fees. And to do so, we can uh, use two you know, typical benchmarks, a perfectly competitive market and a monopolistic market. And in a perfectly competitive market, we have that uh, the market share price elasticity is infinite, meaning that if I raise the price, all consumers will go to my rivals, and therefore there is no market power, no matter you know, the um, demand uh, price elasticity. In a monopoly situation, on, on the contrary, the market share price elasticity is zero because there is only one firm, so there is no other butchers that consumers can go to uh, to buy their meat, uh, but uh, uh, they can react to a price increase by reducing uh, their demand. And, uh, and one important aspect, which seems trivial, but uh, it will become useful in a minute, is that in a monopoly situation, the monopolist will bear the entire consequence of increasing its price. Okay, if I increase the price by one euro, uh, I will face you know, a demand reduction that is exactly the one that is uh, produced by a one euro increase. This trivial, but uh, that it's not the case when the app is, is there. Okay, so the demand size, uh, the market size price elasticity equals the demand uh, price uh, elasticity. And, 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 and the price is set at the monopoly level. Okay, when we introduce the app, uh, the first consequence is that the market share price elasticity becomes zero, as in a monopoly under some regular conditions, of course, which means that consumers, since they will face the same price on two platforms, uh, do not have any reason to, uh, to, uh, to change, to move from one platform to another on the basis of the price they have to pay, because this is bound to be uh, the same on, on, on both platforms. So, platforms cannot use their fees as you know, a means to move consumers from one platform to another. And the second aspect, which is also important, is that uh, the market size price elasticity is below the demand price elasticity. And the reason for this is that sellers that have to charge the same price on both platforms will add a markup on the average fee of using the two platforms. Okay, so if one platform raises the, its price by one euro, the retail price will increase by less than one euro, because the average fee of the two uh, platforms will increase by less than one euro. So the final result is that uh, uh, platforms will end up charging a price above the monopoly level, a price that is above the price that could maximize their joint profit. All right, so how can we use this uh, analysis to explain the uh, theories of ARM that were uh, developed in the cases I mentioned before? Well, softening competition is self-evident. Uh, platform, uh, platform fees are less effective as a means to compete, uh, and, but there is this risk of overshooting and platforms uh, may charge a price that is above the level they would like to charge. Um, foreclosure. Well, foreclosure is also quite simple to explain if uh, uh, platform one is the incumbent and platform two is the entrant. Uh, Platform 2 cannot actually increase its market share by leveraging on a low-cost, low-price strategy. And uh, if there are some uh, 
sunk costs of entry, uh, the size of the market, the market share that Platform 2 may get may be insufficient to, uh, to cover this cost. And so the Platform 2 may decide to, uh, to remain uh, outside the market. Okay, the same, exactly the same kind of reasoning can explain the efficiency justifications. Uh, free riding, uh, well, you know, uh, if uh, uh, platforms cannot steal consumers by lowering fees, the, 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 the app is actually protecting the investments that one platform is making because there is no risk that uh, one consumer will consume these services on the platform and then move to a cheaper platform that can afford lower lower prices uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, do not you know uh, uh, repay the investment that was made by the, by the platform entry well if you reverse the situation and you consider that platform one is the uh, uh, the entrant and plat platform two is the incumbent then the app can actually uh, be effective in uh, allowing entry because it will reduce the risk that the incumbent will react aggressively to the end of the new of the new platform so we can make sense of these efficiency justifications, but at the same time, we have to recognize that they exactly hinge on the idea that uh, across platform parity agreements will make the platform market less competitive. Okay, that's not totally new in competition law. For instance, in uh, vertical agreements uh, uh, that uh, um, concern selective distribution systems, the idea is that uh, the manufacturer can indeed reduce the degree of price competition among retailers to induce them to compete on other ancillary services, non-price dimensions of their, of their competition. Uh, but at the same time, we have to recognize that in this case, we have a pure vertical situation where the manufacturer is actually harmed by the fact that there is less price competition downstream. And so we can expect that the manufacturer will actually uh, restrain competition downstream if and only if you know, the extra services that will be provided by retailers will effectively uh, increase consumers' benefit. Whereas in this case, we have that uh, APA are restricting price competition in the same market where they are. So there is no presumptions that, that we can make about you know, the uh, social or consumer welfare effect of these clothes. Okay, so far I have imagined that uh, uh, sellers have just to decide uh, the price that they have to charge on these two platforms, but they have other ways to induce consumers to move from one platform to another. And if a platform is charging a lower fee, this means that on that fee, sellers can gain higher margin, so they have you know, reasons to adopt any kind of strategy that can you know, move consumers to uh, the, the platform that guarantees the highest margin. And the simplest way to do so is not to trade with the platform that is charging the highest fee. So we have to uh, figure out why uh, platform, why sellers are actually accepting to uh, sign uh, agreements that contain this kind of restrictive clause uh, in the first place. And 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 um, and if 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 platforms uh, if platforms were perfect substitutes meaning that uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of, uh, uh, of uh, um, sales that sellers would make depends only on the quality of its product and the price that they charge. They could move from one platform to another easily, and therefore there is no way of uh, you know, getting any benefit from, from, from the across-platform parity agreement, because if the platform then tries to raise the price, uh, the, 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 the fee, the seller will decide to stop trading with that platform. So this means that if we see uh, 
this kind of clauses in the market, this means that uh, platforms must have some captive consumers, must have some market power in the first place, also without the, uh, the parity clause. <laughs> Uh, another implication is that uh, uh, this platform may try to impose more general uh, parity clause that do not only refer to prices but other to uh, other other selling conditions. Okay, very briefly, what are the consequences of this idea on the uh, on the theory of SARM and economic justification? Well, softening competition becomes less plausible, in my view, because you know we have a market where some market power existed already before the APA, and at the same time, uh, the uh, parity clause may overshoot, as I said before. A foreclosure becomes even more credible because uh, the APA is actually imposed by a player that is already, uh, has already a very strong position in the market and can leverage on other uh, factors to increase this position. Uh, free riding becomes as a general uh, explanation of these clauses becomes uh, less uh, plausible because uh, we are somehow assuming that the platform has you know, some captive consumers, has the ability uh, to reap the benefits of, uh, of its investments and these investments are actually rewarded by the loyalty of consumers and entry is less credible uh, because uh, APA can be imposed only by companies that have some hold on the market, which was not the case for Apple, but uh, at the same time we have to remember that Apple was selling the iPad that was actually uh, bought by consumers, not just you know, to read books, but for many other purposes. And so in that case, maybe the entry theory could still uh, make sense. A different kind of free riding uh, has to be considered anyway, and it's based on the idea that these intermediaries um, perform a matching function. And this is especially true for uh, OTA, or line travel agents. The, the main function they perform is to match you know, hotel and travelers. In the same way as a real estate agent matches uh, the owner of a uh, house and, uh, and, and the person that wants to buy that house. And, and those kind of intermediaries uh, face a typical free riding problem. And the problem is that once the matching function has been performed, the two parties have no reason to trade through the intermediary. And they're better off if they save on the intermediary fee and you know, trade directly uh, between themselves. And, and, and that's the reason why uh, uh, the booking, uh, booking insisted in the uh, in investigations uh, by the national competition authorities to have a so-called narrow MFN or narrow APA. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the, the platform allows the seller to charge lower prices on competing platform, but you know, the platform that is run, owned, managed by the same seller. And, and, and uh, uh, apparently the reason is that they want to avoid that uh, consumers can, uh, you know, uh, use the platform for its matching function and then simply go to the website of the hotel and buy the room directly on, on, on the hotel. Now the issue is whether this kind of narrow app uh, really strikes the right balance and I agree with uh, uh, um, Pezzoli when he said that maybe a full-fledged investigation could have shed some light on, 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 on this issue because, you know, this kind of uh, uh, clause uh, does not restore competition in the market. It reduces the negative impact on competition of the uh, parity clause, uh, but it doesn't uh, uh, mean necessarily that uh, uh, um, the incentives of sellers and platforms will be exactly the same 
that's the case in which we have no parity clause. And moreover, uh, this kind of free writing problem exists only for a typical business model, and a business model in which platforms are paid through uh, uh, a transaction based fee, whereas if they use other business models, such as the advertising model, the subscription models, this kind of free writing problem uh, does not exist anymore. And so the issue is whether the uh, transaction-based fee model is actually more efficient than the other models. And we do know nothing about that. Uh, we cannot say that it's more efficient because, you know, Booking decided to adopt it <laughs> or because it was very successful, because uh, this, is, this just proves that it was very successful for them. That doesn't mean that it's you know, the most socially uh, efficient way of uh, uh, performing this intermediary uh, function. So my conclusions are that, very briefly, that in my view, foreclosure is actually the most likely uh, theory of harm. Uh, efficiency justifications are there. They do make sense, but they are not totally uh, convincing. Uh, free riding on uh, the matching function of this platform is a real issue. Um, but we do not know, unfortunately, maybe we will know from the German uh, case, not sure about that, but we don't know whether you know, the, the narrow uh, parity clause is actually the best way to balance uh, 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 the various interests in the market. And I stop here. Thank you.